Thank you very much, uh, Deborah, for that uh, introduction. We are just from break, and uh, I'm in a very good point to look at those who will be maybe trying to uh, let their heads go a little lower or down. So if I see you sleeping, I'll say stand up because I know all your lips. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm going to talk about uh, building capacities of repositories, but this is what the repository in the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science Center, this is what we've done to build capacities and it's ongoing. We are still uh, building more using um, different methods. Our repository um, really went um, global in 2009 and uh, since then we've been moving uh, gradually but at a very steady uh, pace. We all know what repositories are, so I just put this as an introduction. Being an um, alternative means of publishing scholarly information and also making the scholarly work of researchers um, available globally which brings about uh, their works being well cited as you saw what Deborah presented. And also making the institution's intellectual output uh, really come out for to make them uh, more visible and also increase their impact. And it's also a method for long-term archiving of um, research works. Now, um, why do we need capacity building? for repositories, and here, what, what guided our own our thoughts and our work was that uh, it should be the primary aim to build and strengthen the capacity of repository managers, administrators, the library staff, stakeholders, and all the others who will be involved in establishing, managing, and using the intellectual output recorded in their repositories. And the capacity building is also needed to ensure that work on the repository is uninterrupted, it gives optimum service to its users, and the repository is also sustained and reliable. In my university, the institutional repository is situated in the library, and uh, uh, we have others working with us along that line. When do we need capacity building? And before it's even uh, created, during its creation and also the operation. Because um, before it's created, you need personnel who need to accept and work with it. Institutional repositories came in and it was very new to several people. So it took us a lot of time to convince um, our stakeholders that this is something which is going to be very useful to them as individuals and also to the university. And we needed that to ensure that the stakeholders buy into what uh, uh, we wanted to do. So we started the repository, and then we had to keep on building capacity to enable us to correct any mistakes in the process. Because we acted like a guinea pig in the country. So we went through some kind of uh, ups and downs. And also it helped us during the creation to train personnel, more personnel, and also to tighten the, losing, uh, the loose ends. We are now working, it's operating, but then we need to make sure that we update some of the information as we go along. And this also improves our services. Now, uh, for building it, definitely we started with workshop where we uh, trained the library personnel, faculty, researchers, the institutions, administrators, getting them to know what the whole thing is all about. Then we moved to conferences, seminars, and in recent times, uh, we've been taking part in uh, webinars to ensure that we have the current um, information going around globally. On the job training is what we also resorted to on one-on-one um, -on -one training going around. We initially trained a few people and these people now go around to train others in running their repository more effectively. And in fact, we are also doing that for the other repositories in the country. There are about four or five now in the country. Then the staff in the um, repository office, they also join this IR, IR communication platform where they, uh, they share knowledge and network with other colleagues in this uh, IRAfrica.info group. 
Now, this group consists of uh, a community of experts in the IR, and they exchange ideas and then improve on what they know. Then there is also the forums where the staff also share, and then using tweeting and podcasting if there are any activities like we have it now. Then a toolkit was also developed, which I think we took part, we did that with KIT and IFOL, there was a, a toolkit developed, and also AAU, Association of African Universities, and also that is still being used for, uh, to build capacity in the repositories of the various institutions. Sometimes, too, you go on the net and you see these resources on the uh, survey reports where they are like fact sheets. Those ones are also used uh, to build capacity. And then when you go to some of these uh, institutions with IRs, you look at their website, you see the news and events, and then you also um, get to know one or two new things that you can use. Um, the capacity building, first we started with the library personnel because we needed, one person brought in the idea but we needed a team to work with. So we had to organize some kind of uh, training for the library personnel because they had to take this thing forward. So they would need to share with the institutions management, the faculty and researchers. And also we also had to build the capacity of the staff who run the repository. And the important thing was building their capacity, we had to also include the fact that they need to stay on the job because when you train and they move on, it becomes a difficult task. So we try to reorientate their mind towards staying in the repository and what it is in there for you and how you're going to grow. So we put that. Then we also have to let people know, especially the library staff, how to do mediated archiving because definitely starting from the stretch, uh, from the scratch, you need to do that before you're able to train faculty to do self-archiving. Um, then we, need to, we needed to do monetary evaluation because this is very necessary for us to know how well the repository is doing. And then the software plan, or platforms which we need to uh, build um, the repository on, we used, we tried others, but we settled on this space. So that is what uh, we built the capacity of people in. So the first was the library personnel. Then we moved on to champions. We decided that uh, we needed uh, champions among the researchers and the faculty. So we identified one strong champion from each college. We have six colleges in my institution. And we sat them down and then got them into understanding what the whole thing is about. And then these people went back to their colleagues to share because definitely when they share, we then they take them more seriously than me coming in thinking I'm an intruder, wanting to bring something else which is not acceptable to faculty and researchers. Then we moved on to the faculty and researchers themselves so that they will understand what the whole uh, thing is about, the benefits, what's in it for them and for the institution, and also got them into uh, self archiving, letting them know how to do it themselves and also downloading uh, information effectively from the IR. Then the key thing was also to let them know about complying with copyright issues because most of them wanted to bring in the articles but they had signed them away to the publishers. So we had to take them through how to go around it through preprints or going directly to seek uh, permission from the journals before bringing in the articles to the IR. Uh, to the IR. So all these things, we build that capacity, and most of them have gone through that, and they are using that effectively. Then again, we also took them through the software so that they will understand what it's all about. Then we went to the IT personnel, because in my university, the library has got a server, but we all go through the house to outside, through the, we call it, network operation center. So we had to tell them how to maintain a good network connection to ensure that the repository is always alive, give us enough uh, bandwidth so that we can upload and download easily. And also the issue of ensuring that um, there's very, very uh, uh, reduced downtimes. And this brings me to, I think, sometime in June, May, June, that category of staff were on strike in the university because of salaries and they decided to switch the system down, and that was when they were taking the ranking uh, 
figures. I mean, you can imagine how I felt. And immediately after, some of them came to my office wanting something. I nearly strangled them. <laughs> because they, they really made us feel bad. So we, in spite of the fact that we took them through the, the, the reasons why there should be enough, and the system must be up and running, they still did that and we manifest. But we, we just told them that. Then incidentally, we also introduced them to the DSpace um, software which uh, we were using. Because we needed them as a backup sometimes. We have um, an IT support unit within the library, but then going outside, we needed them to work with. Then the repository administrator himself, himself and his uh, team, we also built the capacity in um, how to uh, implement the repository and customizing the software because we use this space, but we customize it to suit our needs in our institution. And then also took them through creation of a user report because we needed that to back our demand for some facilities from the university. And also on the digital preservation issues and maintenance of the equipment, which was very, very critical. Then we went to repository manager and his team, who also handled the human issues, took them through good public relations, how to collect information from uh, faculty and researchers, and also how to go through the um, content policies. So we had to even develop a policy for the repository itself. And with that, we received a lot of uh, uh, tutoring from Irina here to get the policy right in place. Then the repository manager also had the capacity built in him to train other users. To carry out advocacy was also key. And also how to register the repository with the Oyster, Open Door, Roa, and the rest to make sure that they are easily uh, searchable. Then the institutions administrators themselves, because uh, if we formulate the policy, we will need the institution to approve it. So we need them to let them know, build the capacity that without this, the repository cannot run. So we brought them into that. And also let, uh, made them to understand how we would need the administration to support us in terms of uh, getting um, faculty to bring in their research results and also if there was need for any funding, because we started without any funding from the main university, but the library's funding is what we started with. Then we also needed to set up a repository committee, and with that we needed the, um, the assistance. And these, these processes really helped us, because at the end of the day, all the people in the university, they now know what it is about. But if we had excluded them, not build their capacities, there will have been problems around um, a certain situation and time. Then the committee too, we had to build the capacity of the members, how to fundraise to maintain the repository, monitor and evaluate uh, uh, the uh, to sustain the repository. We needed to do that because the, the, the team was responsible to the vice chancellor himself. So they needed to, I mean the committee responsible to the vice chancellor and also how to set up standards and guidelines which will uh, be uh, OI, OI compliant. And the biggest issue of managing digital and copyright rights, we also had to build the capacity because we had a lot of questions coming up that why do we need to do that? I have written my paper and I can put it in. So we had to go through and the committee being a big group, they were able to understand that and giving a lot of support to the repository and also on long-term preservations, decisions, whether we're going to use the bit or format um, preservation. Now, I, this is just practically what we did, but then at the end of the day, we found out that by building the capacity, it has put our repository on a very firm footing, and then it's helping us to also um, bring in new developments which updates the repository. For instance, any time that this space is updated, we also go to that. If there are any new things, we introduce them into our repository. 
and we've also, it has also ensured proper management structures which have been put in place. Now everything moves slowly. If I'm not there today, other people are there to do the job. And also, when you build the capacity, the key people are given a, a lot of knowledge which are also uh, constantly uh, updated. And it also ensures that the stakeholders have the knowledge of the benefits, and so they buy in it to sustain it. Because without getting them in, building their capacity along with all these other people who are not working in the library, it, there should have been a situation where one day they will say, we don't know anything about it, but we've been able to do that. And that is what has really held our uh, repository uh, strong and in place. Thank you. Hi, man. Um, my name is Miriam Kantamoni, and uh, I'm a librarian and uh, also a researcher at the Ohio State University. And uh, one of the things I'm working on, I'm only just uh, kind of started to. Uh, analyze this is um, I've been doing just trying to get a, a, an idea of um, um, institutional repositories in Sub-Saharan Africa because as I say my interest really is in um, getting um, pro knowledge produced in Sub-Saharan Africa in um, North America but especially my institution and one of the things I can tell you is so you don't need to strangle <laughs> those folks is that um, your repository really is, um, I mean, has done, from what I have seen in my data, doing a lot of work and um, has done quite well in terms of um, being visible. And I think that is mostly because of um, having um, um, your researchers register. Uh, well, will you register with um, Open Door, for example? Because I'm also kind of looking at those that are registered and those that are not how that would feature in my Google search um, results and um, on Google or outside of that. So I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. Thank you very much, my dear yeah. fellow librarian. Uh, my name is Sarah Mangani from Cambridge, Kenya Medical Research Institute, in Nairobi, Kenya, Nairobi. Uh, I wanted to find out what, if you have ever encountered any challenges in the uh, even in capacity building, or as you have been moving on, is there anything that you maybe you could uh, give us so that we be prepared as we move on um, to to establish uh, the stories in our in our individual organizations? The, the 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 challenges you are likely to encounter is getting researchers <laughs> to bring their research output for you to put them in the repository. That is, we still have that problem. So now what we have done is, in our college, we have six colleges, so I have taxed each college librarian to use one week to sit on, virtually sit, quote unquote, to sit on a researcher to collect what he has. So if we will go to that. So I said, well, even if you do one researcher a week, in a year I will get 52 of these uh, uh, works, two, 52 researchers getting their work into the repository. But don't let that you know, discourage you. Whatever you have, you put. And sometimes, to, when you hear that there is a conference somewhere, and some of them have presented papers, you can also pick it from there, once they are staff of your institution. So whoever is in charge of the repository must be up and doing, have his or her ears on the ground, picking these conferences here and there to be able to pick up. But that's the major challenge, is getting the institutional repository populated. That's the big challenge. Uh, I'm also a librarian. I just want to add a voice to what my dear sister for Ohio said. KUNST is doing a very good job. And they are pioneers and they are true that Madam has received so many awards. And I just want to congratulate her for the great job. In fact, she, she is our role model. <laughs> In Ghana, she is a woman. What are you doing? Thank you. And I hope you help us all the other people to take out and to share There's a reason why we made the Open Access Advocate of the Year last year, if not. Um, last one, and then we'll go to the panel discussion. 
uh, I think I'll be speaking, and I don't want to actually monopolize the motion. Mark, what I would like us, would like to know for you, uh, do you have your uh, repository online that we can access? It help us in the possibly on the online address so that people are able to. And, uh, and also, if I may suggest, the processes you use in being able to establish this repository, if you can make a small report, make it available to Omar Debra, and let him disseminate among those of us here, especially our honorable librarians here, to be able to do something in their various university libraries. Thank you. I think I have a, um, building up the repository, I have an article in Library Management, Emerald Library Management, 2011 or 2010, I forgot, which I, I went through what, how we got the repository done. And this presentation will be with a uh, so you can always uh, have access to it. Thank you very much, Helena.